Welcome to Educate, Inform, and Challenge. My name is Teresa McLennan, and I'm the Executive Director of the Women and Children's Shelter of Barrie. The goal of our program is to talk about the lives of women, uh, issues of violence, women in leadership, gender equity, and really dive into the lives and experiences of women from all walks of life. We're really glad that you're with us today, and we're really excited about our guest, and we will uh, welcome him in just one moment. Before we dive in uh, to talking with our guests, we do want to acknowledge and thank our Indigenous uh, family, our Indigenous partners for allowing us to share in this space, allowing us to have these conversations. We thank you so much. So today, I am thrilled to welcome Keenan Alwyn, who is the Ward 2 City Councillor. Keenan, welcome to the show. We're so glad you're with us. Happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. So before we dive in, we are going to be talking about community safety. And of course, you are the city councillor for the downtown area. So, you know, the work that we do here uh, at our shelter, just to let our viewers know, if you're unaware, we do support women who have had an experience of violence and their children. And we try to always work with women to create safety plans. So how can they be safe uh, when they're driving their car? How can they be safe uh, using social media? How can they be safe when they are in areas of the community? And women come and go freely from the shelter, so very much may access the downtown area. And so putting into perspective our conversation today about community safety, we want to always just remember the higher incidence of violence that are experienced by women and the importance of creating safe communities. So we're going to dive into that a bit today with Keenan and just talk about movement that's happening in the city, wonderful plans and ideas that they have. And uh, so we're really looking forward to diving into that. So where we want to start is, uh, Keenan, what are the important things to consider when trying to create a safe city or even specifically a downtown area? Mm -hmm. Great question. Uh, I think the first thing that uh, we all have to consider when we're thinking about these issues of safety is where we're coming from. The experiences that we have uh, may be very different from what other people experience. Uh, I'm a white, cisgendered man, uh, and I live in downtown Barrie, and my experience uh, will be completely different from someone else, maybe a, a person of color or a woman or someone who's transgender, uh, will experience our downtown in a completely different way. And one of the most important things from the city's perspective to consider uh, in terms of downtown safety is how we design our public spaces, how we make them safe, how we make people feel more safe uh, through those designs and through the layout of our city. And then also how we plan and grow our city. Um, we have a lot of growth happening within our downtown and that'll bring more people uh, and create a more vibrant, uh, more walkable community with more people on the streets and uh, more people on the streets means safer streets um, because uh, you know people can look out for each other and care for each other. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the main things that the, the city is looking at in terms of downtown safety. Um, and I do want to note that Barrie is consistently ranked as one of the safest cities in all of Canada. Um, and the downtown has a crime rate that's um, relatively uh, even with the rest of the city. Um, but then we also hear from people and particularly women that their experience uh, doesn't jive with those statistics uh, and that women uh, still experience violence, uh, harassment, um, and don't feel safe in our downtown. And that tells me that uh, this issue has to do with uh, misogyny and systemic sexism. And uh, those are big issues that we need to tackle and, and get right. I really appreciate that you have brought those into our conversation because that certainly is so much of the work that we do here with women to educate them. Uh, you know, we 
we support a lot of women who don't even realize what they've been experiencing is actually violence. Mm -hmm. And we have to try and educate them about what that looks like. And so, and I really appreciate what you're saying about, you know, community spaces are for everyone. And, and, you know, very challenging to create a space that meets the needs of everyone, but it is possible, it is doable when we have an acceptance and acknowledgement of the life experiences that everyone brings and just how they're living their lives, right? And I totally agree with you that safety comes by people and community. We rely on police services. We rely on, uh, you know, officials, municipal officials to try and create safety for us. But we have such a responsibility ourselves as community members to be the ones to create safety. So I just really want to thank you for bringing those pieces into the conversation today because it is so important for folks in the community to recognize that. So when you talk about what a safe community looks like, uh, you've talked about it a little bit, but how do you feel that the city of Barrie is doing, and in particular, the downtown core? Mm -hmm. um, I think we have a lot of work to do still. Um, and I think I, I've been thinking about what this idea of public safety means and what it looks like. And I think this pandemic has really taught us a, a lot of lessons uh, about safety and how we can make our communities uh, and our world more safe. Um, we know that people who are unhoused, people who are experiencing homelessness, um, have had particular difficulty during this pandemic. So everyone having a house a roof over their head, that's safety. Um, housing is a human right. Um, we know that people who are aging in our community um, in long-term care have faced uh, you know, just incredible tragedy. And um, the people who work in those facilities as well have faced a lot of hardship through this pandemic. So how can we look at that as, as public safety as well? How do we improve our social and community services so that everyone, um, and particularly vulnerable people, are cared for? Um, and then I think also something that's been so critical during this pandemic is our public spaces and how we use our outdoor public spaces um, and how essential that is for well-being, um, our mental health. Uh, and that's also safety. Um, when people aren't um, doing well in terms of their mental well-being, that can cause a lot of issues in our community and can be at the root of, uh, of crime uh, and violence. And so that's something that we always need to be thinking about as we plan and grow our city. Um, we do have a new community safety and well-being plan that the city is talking about right now. It is up for final approval at Barry City Council soon. And I'm hopeful that that plan can be our, our sort of guiding light um, in this work to, to make our community the safest possible place it can be. And uh, a lot of the actions in that plan take an equity lens and, and looking at how we can uh, address those different experiences that people have based on their gender, uh, their sexual orientation, uh, their race, um, their socioeconomic status, and uh, how we can really get to the root of some of those issues. There is so much that, that we could dive into, Keenan, because I'm just, I'm so appreciative of what you're saying. And, you know, even just talking about housing, because, you know, folks who are uh, unhoused, who, who don't have, let's say, a permanent residency, how housing looks to them can be very different than how we define what housing looks like. And, you know, uh, and I, and I, so I think that it, it's important that we are meeting people where they're at and working with those folks to hear from those folks about what does your housing, as an example, need to look like for you in particular, a very individualized, uh, you know, as much as possible approach, right? Meeting all different needs in the community. And I think also in our conversation, talking about looking at things also from a trauma-informed lens in terms of can we build communities that acknowledge the life experience that people bring that is, that is guiding the decisions that they're making in their lives and that decision makers and agencies 
have a perspective and an understanding of that as opposed to a judgment to that, I think that that would really help us in creating, let's say housing as an example, housing options that actually meet the needs of people where they are at, as opposed to us defining it, we ask them what works for them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's such a critical piece. Um, and there's a saying that comes to mind um, and it's uh, nothing about us without us. Yeah. And uh, I think that's really the heart of, of what you're talking about there. Mm -hmm. And respecting that lived experience that people have, that is the, uh, that's expertise. Um, and we should be listening to that expertise and, uh, and including people in the process as we work to address some of these issues. And um, the reality of the way our uh, government and society works is that the people right now in positions of power and historically uh, have overwhelmingly been male, have overwhelmingly been white, uh, and to a large extent have been wealthier uh, and well-connected. And so it's uh, those experiences, those different experiences that people have, uh, those wide-ranging experiences that people have, aren't necessarily present in those decision-making roles. And uh, I think that's why we, we see these issues persist. Um, so including people, giving them um, an opportunity to engage in a meaningful way and uh, ensuring that they have uh, the power to um, make decisions about their own lives and about their community's lives uh, is really important. I, I could not agree more with everything that you've just said. And it's so aligned with, uh, you know, how we try to do our work even here at the shelter. We come from a lens of anti-oppression, anti-racism, and of course, a feminist perspective. But I am extremely uh, uh, reminding myself and aware of the privilege that I hold as a white woman working uh, at this agency and just as a white woman in the community. And so we are... Uh, we have a very active survivors group, as an example, that we are continually asking to guide, direct, have input, and encourage us as an agency, tell us what the services need to look like for you, as opposed to me defining that. Because me defining that upholds that privilege and power that I have, and trying to balance that out is just so crucially important to the work that we do. And I, I think it is just a wonderful conversation and perspective that hopefully we get an opportunity to dive into more and but also to share with other folks, right? So, you know, we're going to take a very quick break. And we just really encourage our viewers to stay with us as we dive in more and continue this great conversation with Keenan. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Educate, Inform, and Challenge, and we're really glad that you're with us today. We're having a great discussion with Keenan Aylwin, who is the Ward 2 City Councilor. We're talking about community safety. We're talking about power and privilege, just so many pieces to our conversation today. So we're really glad that you're with us. So we are going to dive in a little bit more talking about community safety and in particular the downtown core and what initiatives the city of Barrie is looking at. So Keenan, can you maybe walk us through some of the thoughts and some of the movement that's happening uh, with the city and community partners in addressing community safety in the downtown core? Absolutely. Uh, so one of the most interesting initiatives that has uh, come to light is it was started by um, a resident, a young woman named Jasmine Botter, who um, had an experience, uh, an awful experience in our downtown. Uh, her and her friends uh, experienced harassment in our downtown and um, they didn't feel safe and were worried about their city and their downtown and how they could um, do something about it. And Jasmine took it upon herself to create a petition and post uh, posters around the downtown asking people to sign this petition in support of downtown safety and in particular for women. And uh, that petition just took off like crazy. And um, it was such an amazing thing to, to see. And um, I reached out to Jasmine uh, and I know a, a couple of other 
people on council reached out and uh, the very police reached out and uh, it started a wonderful initiative with uh, the Very Women and Children Shelter, yourself, Teresa, and Very Police, the downtown uh, business improvement area, and uh, and Jasmine herself. And we discussed ways that we could improve the safety situation in the downtown. And the first step was to actually conduct a safety audit. Um, so we took a walk around the downtown and um, identified areas uh, in the neighborhood that could use some love, uh, whether it was lighting or, um, you know, if, if there was a place where cameras may need to be set up. And uh, an officer with the Barry Police, Kara Brooks, ended up doing a report uh, on that safety audit. And from there, we were able to um, start an initiative uh, to have some more lighting in two of the alleyways as a pilot project. Uh, and it should be installed any day now. And uh, we're hoping that that can be expanded to other areas of the downtown where that's needed. And there was also uh, an aspect of that, which that program, which was uh, called Bright Spot. And um, that was a program where uh, a business could receive uh, some informational uh, training around um, you know, trauma in, a trauma-informed approach to uh, some of the issues, the safety issues that we, we have in our city. And uh, that was offered through the Barry Women and Children's uh, Shelter and uh, the Downtown Business Association. And um, if they participated in, in one of those sessions, then they received a sign, a bright spot sign to put up in their window and let people know that they are a safe place to go. If, if someone's having an issue in the downtown, if they're in distress or if, uh, you know, there's someone who's bothering them or threatening them or um, you know they're just generally feeling unsafe that they can head into that business and let the people who are working there know that they need help and um, those businesses uh, now know where uh, where some of the resources in the community are and where to direct um, people who who need help in the moment so uh, you know it, it started off with a uh, an awful experience that Jasmine had in our downtown and and those experiences those types of things are completely unacceptable and we we can't let those types of things happen um, but it did end up because of Jasmine's hard work end up being um, a positive thing for the community as a whole and I'm really excited uh, about what uh, we can con continue to do uh, with that initiative we were really honored to have Jasmine as one of our guests and she was talking about her experience. And so, uh, you know, so important for every community member and women in particular, when we're talking about violence, for women to gain their power and gain their voice and use it. And Jasmine absolutely did that and motivated the city uh, our agency, so many around her to take action. And um, we were able to provide that training for sure to the downtown businesses and included Salvation Army and Shaq's World as well, uh, you know, supporting youth in the community and then the wonderful work that the Salvation Army does uh, with their men's shelter and meals. So, you know, it really was the voice of this young woman uh, who pulled community partners together to make a really great initiative take off. And so we're extremely proud to be a part of that and very thankful to be asked, uh, you know. And of course, we support women. We know that one in three women will have an experience of sexual harassment or violence. Uh, almost 70% of Canadians know a woman who has experienced violence. And those, those numbers are very real. They're certainly reflective of the numbers of women that we see here in our shelter with their children. And, uh, you know, for our, our viewers, we have a 27 bed shelter. We run closer to 35 and have to refer out 500 women, over 500 women every year. So we always want to lift the veil and say that the uh, violence, harassment of women is existing. It's alive and well here in our community of Barrie. But together, community partners, the city of Barrie, we can do some incredible things to try and change that. And I think that that initiative is a really great one. So I want to switch gears here because I wanted to talk a little bit about the safe consumption site. and. 
long been discussed, long been recognized that we needed that here in the community. And lots of discussions uh, with, with community folks, uh, hopefully, you know, people with lived experience and city council to figure out the best place for the safe consumption site, but also how you create safety for the folks who are going to use that service and then also for just the general community. So are there any ideas or thoughts about that, those safety needs? Like how is the city making decisions and, and working through all the needs to create the, that site? Mm -hmm. It's a big question, but yeah. It is, it is a very big question, uh, but an important one. And um, first of all, I think it's important that we um, note the extent of problem with the toxic drug supply crisis here in Barrie and then the sheer number of people who um, are overdosing and who are dying in our community. And we have uh, an overdose rate that's eight times the provincial average here in Barrie. Um, and we're, we're losing people at an alarming rate. And uh, those people are our family, our friends, our neighbors, and people who use drugs deserve uh, to be safe and deserve to live a life of dignity. Um, so, so that's number one. Um, number two, I think it's important for us to talk about the evidence uh, and the peer-reviewed data around supervised consumption sites um, and the reality of these sites where they've been operating across the country uh, for years now. Um, the reality is that not only do these sites save lives, um, but they can also reduce instances of public drug use. They can reduce instances of discarded needles in the neighborhood where they're located. Um, they reduce um, bloodborne infections. And um, there is no data that suggests that there is an increase in crime associated with a supervised consumption site. Um, but having said that, I think we do still need to take the concerns of the community uh, very seriously and ensure that we're engaging the community, working with the community to address issues as they come up. And I know that the applicants uh, for the supervised consumption site, uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association of Simcoe County and the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit uh, take that very seriously as well. And that's part of their uh, application is how do we mitigate uh, any potential issues uh, in the site and around the site, um, and how do we engage the neighborhood on a regular basis to ensure that we're working together uh, to make the safest possible neighborhood for everyone. Um, so I'm feeling very hopeful that we can um, both implement this essential life-saving service as soon as possible, it's long overdue, uh, and also make sure that our community remains a safe place to be uh, and gets even safer year after year. Has a decision been made in terms of where that site is going to be? So uh, there is a proposed location at this time and uh, Barry City Council will be uh, uh, considering it very soon. Um, so the applicants are recommending uh, 11 Innisfil Street, which is the rear of the building at 80 Bradford Street. Uh, and it's a large commercial building on Bradford Street. And uh, there's there's a, an entrance at the back along Innisfil Street where they're proposing to put, uh, to put the site. Yeah. So I guess then city council in partnership or collaboration will make a decision if that's kind of where it finally lands. And uh, I guess the benefit to that location, because I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, the location needs to be accessible uh, for folks to be able to easily get to it, right? And so near the buses, you know, all those pieces are, are or walking distance is so key, right? So, uh, you know what, we really look forward to that. And uh, we certainly support that. Our work at the shelter, we, we approach things from a harm reduc reduction perspective. And certainly we don't um, uh, promote or uh, allow women to use in the shelter, but we try to uh, encourage and talk about how they can use safely. And uh, if women choose to use, and we have all of this very in-depth understanding about why uh, the women that we support need and feel that that's how they want to uh, conduct themselves right now, 
we want to work with them. And so how can we create safety around that? And so we are very, very supportive of, of the site when that gets uh, launched, because we would love to add that in terms of our level of support that we can offer to the women who are here. And, uh, you know, I think eight times the provincial average is a number that folks need to really, uh, that needs to resonate with them and know that that number is so high without any kind of a safe consumption site. And so that number is so incredibly high, we could only do better by having a site in terms of bringing that number down. So I just really thank you for your voice and the work that you're doing uh, with regards to that. Because I, I do believe that you carry a lot on your shoulders and you, you hear the voices of everyone in the community and have to balance what everybody wants and everybody's coming from their own uh, different perspective, of course, right? And that must be very challenging to balance, but there's great movement and great recognition, I believe, in uh, having no judgment to the decisions that people are needing to make for their own lives at any given moment. But how can we support them and how can we create safety around that as a community because it benefits every single one of us. So we've got about one minute left, Keenan, and I want you to look into your kind of your magic ball and think about, uh, you know, if you had a vision for what the downtown would look like in terms of safety thriving, what would be your, your thoughts about what that would look like? Hmm. I think we are on the verge of some really excellent things in our downtown. We are seeing a lot of proposed uh, new developments, which will bring more people to our downtown. Uh, and like I said earlier, that creates a more vibrant community, um, a vibrant business community, more eyes on the streets, so safer streets. Um, and I think we're going to become a more diverse community as well, which is, which is extremely important. And so I'm feeling very optimistic about our future in the downtown, and I think we're headed in the right direction. It's uh, not always going to be easy, and it's going to be a bumpy road, but uh, we all need to work together to make sure we can create the best downtown possible. Well, Akina, I want to thank you so much today for the conversation and just sharing the work that you're doing with the community, and we hope our viewers have enjoyed today and, of course, educate, inform, and challenge our thinking. Stay tuned. We hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.